So I'm E.E. E. Miller, hi, um, and I'm a visiting professor teaching video art production at UMass this semester at Amherst College next semester. I'm really pleased to introduce Sophie Topin. <laughs> um, Sophie is an independent Canadian researcher, organizer, and activist. Um, she works with groups, collectives, and NGOs fighting for social justice, dignity, and self-determination. Um, she's worked around the world covering issues ranging from women's rights, peace and security issues, community media, and new media. Um, she's, in addition to being an associate here, she's currently an associate researcher with the Center for Peace Mission Studies at the University of Quebec in Montreal, a co-founder of the Women, Peace, and Security Network Canada, and the Canadian Focal, Gender Focal Line for Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflicts. Um, more about, lately she's been involved as an activist and a researcher uh, looking at the, working with Occupy, the Student and Social Strike in Quebec, and the Squatting Europe Collective. Um, I wanted to also just um, share a story about Sophie's contribution to the expansion of the media landscape here in our community. Um, I think it was in 2006, um, I was part of Valley Free Radio, um, which was launching its uh, our local low-power FM station in um, Northampton, in Florence. And Sophie came with the Prometheus radio project and radio producers and, and uh, media activists from all over the country and beyond to do a barn raising and actually launch and build our station, which was an incredible weekend of activities that involved workshops and literally building a studio in the basement of the Florence Community Center. Um, and I, don't, I didn't meet Sophie at the time, but I learned that we both had our first experience of soldering when we were down in the basement building literally the frame that the equipment for um, broadcasting um, would live, and that was the site at which I created my first radio um, show. So very meaningful and touched me personally. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also an apt image to have at the end of this introduction to Sophie to think about her soldering um, and, and her commitment both to contributing to scholarship on these important subjects, but also how much it's grounded in um, building connections and communication for social justice movements. Sophie. Thank you, Eden. <laughs> That's a great introduction, so thank you. <laughs> Um, so today I'm going to be speaking about the feminist nodes uh, within Occupy Wall Street and um, I just want to say uh, in preamble that initially my research intended to focus um, only on feminist cyber activism or what I called uh, feminist cloud protesting approaches but over the course of uh, the few months that I've been here and also over the course of the, the interview that I've, I've done I've, I've realized um, the importance of uh, focusing on feminist contributions to um, the Occupy movement and uh, contribution that are um, offline, online, and also the relationship between online and offline. Um, so in other words, my research topic has expanded <laughs> a little bit. So uh, yeah. Um, a disclaimer before I start, um, today I will share some of the few preliminary, um, let's say, findings uh, which have not been thoroughly analyzed and um, as you will see some of the material that I'm going to present is still somewhat in a raw format. And, but nonetheless, I think it's very interesting. And um, so my research is still being, um, let's say, shaped. And for that, I welcome your comments and your feedback. So let's, let's start. Um, the surge of, uh, of protests that has swept many countries uh, in the world in the past um, few years, and especially since uh, 2011, um, seems to have signaled a change in citizen action and uh, contentious politics. So in the United States, um, this burst in social movement uh, actions or moments, as some have called it, was manifested by the occupation of parks and squares um, that began with Occupy Wall Street on September 17, 2011, and quickly spread viral to 
uh, more than 800, 850 cities um, in 82 countries uh, in a matter of weeks. Um, and on November 15, 2011, there was uh, the eviction of Zuccotti Park. Um, and um, the eviction was recognized by activists and by, 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 other, um, by, by some authors um, as a national coordinated effort to evict the occupied spaces. Um, so, um, Occupy Wall Street transformed uh, a privately owned property known as Zuccotti Park uh, into an open and inviting uh, space for participant, participants and interested public. Uh, they did so in creating a life of its own, which was, uh, some would argue, an attempt to be post despite capitalist endeavor. Um, direct democracy via General Assembly happened every day to discuss uh, issues that related to Occupy. Um, there was a kitchen that served uh, food almost 24 hours a day. There was sleeping arrangements. There was uh, a library uh, that was uh, set up where people could flirt with zines, with magazines, with books that were rarely available otherwise. And there was also uh, a media center that was created. And um, Occupy Wall Street created its own news. And among them, there was a project um, of the Occupy Wall Street Journal. Um, so to do this, um, to have the park function as somewhat an autonomous entity, um, OWS uh, relied on collective actions via the creation of working groups, of caucuses, of, of committees responsible for a multitude of activities um, and who were accountable to a wider um, general assembly. So with, and now Occupy Wall Street is, 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 is about this and, and much more. Um, so, um, with, with uh, OWS, we've moved from, and I'm going to explain it a little bit, from a movement of movements to a network of networks. So the global justice movement of the early 2000s, which um, I have to mention, contrary to some narratives, did not erupt into the, um, the, 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 the the, the, the battle in Seattle. Um, the roots of the global justice uh, movement can be found um, in different range of movements uh, all over the world. And um, for instance, there was in Italy and in Spain, um, they developed uh, lots of contact with the Zapatista movement um, that was based in, in, in Mexico and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the global justice movement has been described as a movement of movements by De La Porta and, and Mossa in 2005. Um, but this character characterization of a movement of movements um, for Occupy is not appropriate um, as it does not reflect the plurality of components which together created a complex uh, system composed of interacting and interdependent layers that formed an integrated whole. So rather, I follow Manuel Castell's understanding um, that Occupy Wall Street is a network of network. And um, one of the main feature of the, the network social movement is a set of interconnected nodes that make up the network. Um, and it is thanks to these different nodes within a network and their use of ICTs uh, um, that are or appear to be non-hierarchical and decentralized and somewhat non-mediated. When I say non-mediated, I, I talk about non-mediated by the state, non-mediated by um, the corporate media. Um, um, and, and that social movement can be understood largely as horizontal in nature and, um, and leader full. So we have often heard that um, Occupy was a so-called leaderless uh, movement, but that is not an appropriate way um, to explain the movement, um, as network social movements um, evolving in a network society um, will always be leaderful. Um, it is rather the multiple nodes uh, 
which allow for no formal leadership. Um, such movements have no centers. Some would say that, the, that they are um, um, polycentric, um, but all in all, they are decentralized. Um, they opt for a decentralized structure. Uh, structures composed of, as I said, multiple nodes. And, um, and of course, there are some individuals or, or faces of the movement, which is often what the media wants to tell a story. Uh, but all in all, there's no command and control center. Uh, it is the flexibility, fluidity, and malleability of network social movement that allows it um, to to function, to be creative, to be open, and somewhat sustainable. Um, it is also the network nature of the, the movement that Manuel Castells argue to protect the movement. So you cannot destroy the network because of the, its multiple nodes. So within this research, I've, I've decided to bring to the fore um, the feminist intersectional contribution, or what I call the feminist nodes of influence in Occupy Wall Street, to see how and the extent to which uh, it has influenced and shaped the movement. So my research question uh, is there. And when I talk about the nodes, um, I, I refer to um, people, group, things. So a node can be a Facebook page, it can be a Twitter account, it can be uh, a website, it can be a, a caucus, uh, it can be a committee, it can be a, a working group. So it can be multiple things. Um, so why is it important uh, to look at uh, the feminist nodes in Occupy? For many reasons, I've outlined the reasons over here, um, because I would say f uh, first, um, feminism has barely been looked at when talking about the Occupy movement and precisely in, 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 in the academia. Uh, because also it appears uh, as though feminism has been influential in Occupy, but as it stands, <coughs> it has not been visible or worst, it's been uh, demonized uh, for being disruptive and divisive. Um, also, by placing feminist agency um, in the center rather than the margin. Um, this, this project is a way to resist uh, the dominant patriarchal script written about um, and on Occupy. And because feminist claims was, um, they were largely silenced from the Occupy discursive uh, repertoire. And uh, because it appears as though um, there is, um, it's, it's largely thanks to feminism and intersectional issues that issues of discrimination, of oppression, and privileges have been addressed. And finally, no, we're not in a <laughs> post-feminist era. <laughs> so feminism is still very important uh, and a, a very useful tool when studying phenomenon uh, such as social movements. Um, so the methodology that I've been using is based on a case study, as, as, as I said, and I've circumscribed and limited my, my uh, case study to uh, New York. Um, and um, several qualitative methods have been employed um, for conducting th my research. Um, I've been doing and will continue to be doing virtu um, virtual ethnography of websites and other digital tools. Um, in addition to particip participatory, you know, participative, I'm sorry, observation, um, um, that allowed me to be familiar with the actors um, that were involved and to obtain an overall view of um, the intersectional feminist nodes. So, so far, um, I have interviewed um, by Skype or face-to-face -face 17 uh, feminists and allies, and I hope to be uh, interviewing more um, in, in the upcoming weeks. So let's, uh, let's, let's now move to what we can learn from the, uh, the interviews that, uh, that I've done with intersectional feminists and their allies. Um, the first aspect I was interested in um, it was to know the extent to which um, intersectional feminism was present in Occupy. Um, so one of my assumptions from the start was that um, 
there was a, f a, a feminist um, presence in Occupy and there were um, intersectional feminist uh, principles that were foregrounded. Um, and that somewhat <coughs> permeated um, Occupy, but it was largely not visible. So one of the, um, one, one interviewee that I, I, I interviewed basically said, um, I think you should, I think you should, you could see this happening at the beginning, the invisibility of feminism. It was about banking and politics. It was engaging with areas of our society that are male dominated <coughs> and we're not questioning that domination. Uh, but from the start, what happened on the ground in the planning meetings, there were uh, much more cultural critique at work. There was this imperative of horizontalism. Um, there was always a concern about gender and what role a lot of the different social structures and institutions would have on this operation that people were preparing. And of course, people were also frustrated by the lack of feminist analysis. But it was a conversation happening from the beginning. And, and so from that quote and also from, from other quotes, um, we, we see emerge uh, a questioning about the culture of, of Occupy or the, the culture, the values of, of, of Occupy. A culture that was obviously not, not perfect, but yet a culture of a movement that was trying to be as inclusive um, as possible and as receptive to intersectional feminist analysis. And to corroborate um, this, this inclusive culture that uh, Occupy tried to, to create, um, there's this other quote that is fantastic. And one of the interviewees said, it's crazy to be in a paradigm where you have more of a right to call out patriarchy and oppression. Um, so in making connections between different issues, intersectional feminists uh, were really trying to move away from single issue organizing to connecting the dots. So connecting um, capitalism with patriarchy, with uh, austerity measures, with the economic crisis, with the debt, with the prison industrial complex, with, it was about intersecting oppressions. Um, so within the movement, intersectional feminists employed some strategies uh, to render the movement a little bit more inclusive and some, some, uh, are s s some that, were that, that I can highlight um, are uh, first the telling of the gender pronouns. So in some caucuses, um, we, we, would, we would go around and say our favorite gender pronouns. And gender pronouns are, are basically an articulated expression that you should not assume um, the gender of a person by the way uh, the person look, but rather by uh, the way uh, that person want to be identified. Um, there was also the use of progressive stack at general assemblies uh, and uh, progressive stack in, in theory, it basically aimed at elevating certain voices uh, within the General Assembly. And um, finally, there was uh, an adoption of the adoption of a collective uh, community agreement that, in a nutshell, uh, was about um, the behaviors that were acceptable in, in Occupy. Um, so these, these strategies were essential for the movement to learn about gender identity and intersectional uh, um, issues. Uh, to learn that as well the gender binary is recognized by some as patriarchal and um, that to learn about this vocabulary that many did not know about. Um, so these measures, however, did not prevent uh, feminist, queer and uh, women uh, of color, uh, self-identified women, to be um, at times demonized or seen as um, divisive. Um, so they were, they were not a panacea. Sometimes they did not work, um, but it was interesting that they were um, instituted. Um, so um, in creating this culture of, of Occupy, um, this more inclusive culture of Occupy, intersectional um, feminists were key in raising um, consciousness about intersectional issues uh, and concerns. So um, one of the interviewee um, 
that I've interviewed when I asked the question, why did you join the movement? Um, she said that I was very skeptical at first because of the picture that I saw. Um, it was a bunch of, of white males. Um, but the reason I got involved with Occupy is that something was happening in New York and I had also a responsibility to change what was happening in terms of race. Um, so what we can also see from the interviews that, that, I've, that I've done um, is that intersectional feminists joined the movements because they wanted to be involved in certain areas. Um, so sometimes it was in the media um, and some other, times it, some other times it was in, in other groups. Some wanted to be involved in the facilitation uh, group within, within the General Assembly. But what often happened was uh, that intersectional feminists went on to focus on uh, exclusively almost on intersectional issues. And the context of the, I need to explain the context of the, of the next, next quote which is about um, a media training that happened two weeks after the beginning of the uh, so-called occupation on uh, September, uh, September 17. And that, that person was a very active uh, woman, woman that felt that the uh, media representation about Occupied was skewed. And she wanted to change that, so she, um, she organized this um, media training for uh, women, for self-identified women, for queer, um, um, to be able to speak to, um, or, or what she thought was for, 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 these, for these people to be better able to speak to the media. So what she said is, um, so what happened when we went around the group of people we were, we were, who were there at the media training? People started to say that they had problems not only with reporters, but they, had, they were having problems speaking out in general assemblies, in the park, and so on and so forth. So it was good for everyone to hear that uh, they were not alone in experiencing silencing. So I guess for me personally, I decided to work more generally uh, around those gender and oppression issues, even though at first I wanted to be involved in the media. Um, so women queer and, and, and people of color, especially women, women of color, um, went in Occupy to be involved in a, in a variety of, of, of activities. But sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes ended up having uh, to educate um, other occupiers, often white men with privileges, who had of course been disenfranchised by uh, the economic crisis. Um, but um, these, these, these women, these, these queer um, 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 people felt that they, um, there was a, a so-called burden of education uh, that they had, um, that the burden of education basically went on uh, to the people who were leaving uh, these, these oppressions. Um, so the somewhat shortfall of uh, intersectional feminist analysis um, also amplified the <coughs> gendered uh, division of labor within the movement. That's what I found out through the, the interviews that, that I've done so far. Um, so one, uh, one occupier in the physical realm um, that I've interviewed said that, for me, the feminist economy at OWS was atrocious. People who work in the kitchen, the people who helped get clothing supplies, or the people who did the housekeeping task were pigeonholed in those positions. It was as if you had a housewife. Um, the structure of the, the economy of the occupation was not a feminist one. Um, so um, another one uh, that is now in the virtual realm um, said that we did most of the writing and editing. We took care of social media, the Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit account. You know, the behind the scenes stuff. It was mostly white male, men that did and held the live stream cameras and who did the narration. I got sick of hearing the guys. It was also the men who were presented as being the leaders of the movement in the media. And finally, I think a, a, a last quote on that uh, subject of division of labor that also speaks for itself. Um, I think it was a lot easier for men, straight men, to just join any groups uh, that, that they wanted to join at Occupy. 
and not join a group based on their identity or their sexual orientation. It's unfortunate that men did not realize that maybe the reason why they felt so free to join any group is that they had privileges. Many did not ask the question, whose space am I taking and who is being silenced as a result of me taking the space? Um, so so from, from, from this quote and also others, I have so many amazing quotes. Um, we, we see that uh, within Occupy there was some sort of a, a, a gendered task. There were gendered tasks. Um, and, and that um, self-identified women, queer and, 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 and women of color had often to educate and to do, as it was highlighted in the quotes, the behind the scene uh, work. So moving on to the online realm, um, Many occupiers recognize the importance of, of the online realm, uh, but prioritize the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so one interviewee said, um, I continue to emphasize offline meetings and gathering as these um, were the strongest to build the community, to build trust, to build the network that drove Occupy. Among the organizers, I think the most important interaction were offline. So having said that, um, online um, activities were also recognized as, as key to convey messages and information. And in, in fact, it's often thanks to platforms um, such as Facebook, Twitter, and, and Occupy websites as well, and the like, that participants were um, mobilized and organized. Um, so, um, Occupy was, was, was about social networking, but also face-to-face -face and, and, and also on the virtual, um, virtual level. So what, what one um, interviewee said uh, with regard to Facebook is um, Facebook is the same or almost the same as setting up a soapbox in the middle of a public square under City Hall. It's important because that's where people are. And another interviewee said, I've always joked to say that I use Facebook as a platform propaganda. Um, I don't do organizing, at least, uh, at least for me on such platform, but it's useful to share information and analysis. I use it in the capacity that I can. I don't organize with Facebook because I think it's not safe, but sharing news and article is incredibly important. Um, what, uh, what we can say as well um, is that those, some people who did not feel comfortable uh, showing themselves in, in public for a variety of, of reasons were, were able to evolve and some even thrived um, in the online realm. As a case in point, um, there's the um, Trans World Order Affinity Group, um, a group composed mostly of trans women and queer, uh, that started the OccupyWallST.org website. And because they did not feel comfortable enough to go into Zuccotti Park because of a history of homelessness or um, um, anxiety issues, um, they, they, they felt that more comfortable uh, in the online realm. And they actually decided to occupy an empty building, so to squat a building in Brooklyn. Uh, and set up a communication and tech hub. So for them, it was their, their occupied home, their occupied apartment, squatted apartment was an extension of um, Zuccotti Park. And um, their Twitter account um, has, as of today, more than 172,000 followers. Their Facebook page has more than four uh, 400,000 likes. Um, so these are very influential nodes um, because it's, it's them, it's, it's this trans world order affinity group that controls, in a way controls, the means of communications. Um, but for them, they decided to be active on, in the online realm rather than offline. And um, one of them told me that essentially we are bloggers. So that's what protect us. None of us participate in direct actions. Uh, we might tweet about it, write about it. We might, 
we might announce it on our website, but we didn't go to these uh, actions. And that has something to do with our roles of journalists, but also because we're trans women. And the repression that we potentially face within the criminal justice system. Um, so we don't, we don't feel we are arrestable uh, for our own mental health and the situation we would encounter there, that is in prison. Um, so um, in, in, in conclusion, or some pending questions that I have, um, as we can see through the excerpt uh, that I have highlighted today, Occupy is really a complex system. And so with this research, it's really the, um, the, the contribution that I want to make is to highlight the feminist layers and feminist nodes uh, within Occupy, because as I, as I said throughout my presentation, I think that it's um, such contribution are, are, are very interesting, but have not given enough attention. So some of the, the pending question that I have is, how can I strengthen my theoretical framework? It's very, <laughs> very academic in the way that I present it. Um, so how can I strengthen my theoretical framework using both uh, the, the concept of network social movement and intersectional feminism um, as well? Um, I've, I've, I've looked at the culture of occupied, I've looked at the consciousness raising, the intersectional uh, division, feminist division of labor, the online offline interplay. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking about adding other dimension. I was thinking the community centered solutions, um, which is in, in my opinion, very, very feminist. Um, also the, um, the role of emotions um, in, in occupy and in creating and building um, the, the movement. Um, but also if, if you have any ideas and those questions are for you. <laughs> so if you have, if you have ideas, um, please, uh, let me know after, after the talk. And, um, also because I, I want this, um, this research to be a contribution to social movements. So not just an article, like the outcome, I, I just don't want a simple article to be published. I want something more. Um, so I've, I've thought about um, building um, a crowdsourced multimedia platform and a platform that would be probably first populated by um, some of the, the, the content or data that I've collected, but that um, would also uh, grow um, as somewhat of an archive of um, feminist contribution uh, to, to the movement and would be open for intersectional feminists to um, give their input and to, to basically to populate this multimedia platform. So I'm putting it out there and I'm asking you if you think it's an interesting idea. Is it only another, like one of these multiple websites that will have been created or is it something that could be of value um, for, yes, for academics, for students, but also for social movements. Um, and any comments, feedback on the way my research is evolving will be uh, much appreciated and I will stop here. Thank you.